Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Entrepreneurial Exchange, the second edition here, Insights uh, from Entrepreneurs. Uh, before I introduce uh, our guests, uh, very excited about tonight's uh, lineup, and our, our guest is truly a kind of a legend, a legend in Vermont and even nationally in terms of uh, entrepreneurship and um, a uh, number of patents that she's had and things that she's developed over the years. But before that, um, just want to lay out lay out kind of the evening for you. My name is John Rydell. I'm representing CFES Brilliant Pathways, which is a nonprofit that helps uh, underserved students from around the country get to college or career. And we're lucky enough to be uh, partnering with UVM, who's putting on the pitch challenge and really doing uh, a lot of the legwork website. Um, they bring a lot of expertise to the to the field. University of Vermont is certainly a leader in that space. Um, and we appreciate everybody uh, joining us tonight. We know you have some ideas, some questions about your own pitch. And uh, one of our main goals is to give you some tools to help and uh, help you uh, kind of refine that and get it to where you want. Um, so I, in the meantime, I'll, I'll turn it over to Brick Willett. She's going to talk a little bit about um, some of the kind of the nuts and bolts of the uh, of the pitch and some helpful uh, helpful uh, dates and, and, and things coming ahead uh, to help you along. Thank you, John. It's really great to have all of you. I know that it might be a little early, might be a little late in the day. So we really appreciate you being logged in wherever you're watching this from. We hope that you are enjoying all of the different webinars we are doing. I just wanted to give you kind of a quick rundown of the pitch challenge as a whole, just in case you'll see the QR code on there that will link to our Vermont pitch challenge website. That's where you'll be able to sign up for our interest form. If you have not already, I encourage you to do so. You can sign up for the rest of our monthly webinars on there as well. These are all gonna provide some really great insights for you as well as tips and tricks and kind of ideas for really how to craft your own business pitch and proposal. And ultimately that's gonna be what you use for the challenge piece of this, which is really exciting. You will see a little bit about kind of the main questions that we're asking you to answer with your pitch on the screen there, as well as our accepted submission formats that we're doing. We want you to be creative with this. We want you to really show who you are through your business ideas. So we encourage you to submit videos, podcasts, or written documents, whatever you feel is going to help you the best and really tell us your story in the best way. Just as a reminder, the submissions will open January 15th. They will be open for one month exactly. So they will close February 15th and then we will start judging. So we have a lot of time for you to craft your ideas. And then we also just wanted to remind you that the grand prize for this is a full scholarship, tuition and fees to the University of Vermont for each team member who is participating. Our second and third place winners will receive a $5,000 check for each team and fourth and fifth place will receive $1,000. And we really encourage you to really be crafting these throughout the next couple months while you figure out exactly how you want to go about this. So enough of the housekeeping, you are always welcome to email us at btpitch at uvm.edu, but you've heard enough from me. So I'm gonna turn it back over to John. Thanks, Brooke. Yeah, this is, uh, it's an honor for me and I, to introduce tonight's guest, Lisa Lindell, um, co-founder of the Jog Bra, who uh, I, had, I had the pleasure of uh, talking with in a webinar um, a while ago and, and a personal note growing up in Vermont, she's certainly on the on the Mount Rushmore of uh, in, inventors in the state. You know, you can, Ben and Jerry's, the list is long from, from especially when she, back in her day, she's a University of Vermont grad. Um, 1977. And uh, there was at that time, a culture in Vermont where there really was some kind of innovative organic um, inventions that came out of there. And then we kind of spin forward here and we've got a number of companies that, uh, you know, I'm thinking beta, uh, benchmark satellite propulsion company, there's a new, a new breed, if you will, uh, in Vermont, um, and more in the tech space that's really exploding now. But um, Lisa, last time we talked, gave some incredibly insightful uh, um, ideas and just thoughts about how she launched uh, Jog Bra at that time that I think are still very pertinent today. So um, she's in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Like I said, she has 10 patents and she's written two books. Uh, she's She's been successful in multiple spaces. But uh, I, I will I'll turn it over to Lisa and let, have her talk a little bit about her uh, herself and sort of, uh, if you would, Lisa, we'd love to hear kind of, you know, uh, when you first got the idea 
for for jog bra and uh, and then how you sort of uh, went about the thought process of kind of launching it. Happy happy to do that. Happy happy to do that. I although I have to say that um, it was never my intention to start a business to run a business. Um, the, the idea of a sports bra was totally new at the time. It didn't such a thing did not exist, which <laughs> I talk to a lot of young women these days who say, um, you're kidding, what? Hasn't there always been a, a sports bra? And, no, no, <laughs> no, not really. Uh, but I was uh, a runner and uncomfortable. Uh, and also, as you mentioned, John, you have to think of the times. This was in the mid 1970s. And that was a a period of great growth and change, big change. I mean, it was this uh, second wave feminism, it was called. And um, we, were, we, our mothers had been brought up to be m mothers, nurses, teachers. There, you know, women were still in very tight, stereotypical roles uh, when I was growing up. And I think today they would say, what we did with the sports bra was we were being disruptors <laughs> because um, it was in 1972 that the uh, Title IX was uh, created. And Title IX, for those of you that aren't familiar, was said that any institution uh, receiving federal funds had had to uh, it, we're talking about universities and colleges and such. They had to have equal um, availability for sports for women as well as men. Up until then, they were, you know, just they, they were only funding men's sports. So that made a big change. But what Title IX couldn't do, I, what it couldn't do was it could pay for the teams and it could pay help you know, reach out, but those women who wanted to participate were still self-conscious and uncomfortable going on the field. And the sports bra took care of, it really helped with that. It's kind of like the one, two punch. <laughs> so that's, I mean, but I was not, plan I mean, I was a runner, I was uncomfortable and it started out as a joke. Um, really, it was my sister started jogging. And she said, "What do you do to get comfortable?" I said, "I, you know, I've tried everything. There's nothing to do." And she said, "Why isn't there a jock strap for women?" <laughs> that was, I thought, that's not such a bad idea. And um, sat down and wrote down all the things such a garment would have to do. I was really excited about it. I thought, "Wow, maybe there's a solution to this problem." Um but I don't sew. <laughs> the thought of making a garment, you know, what, how? Um, but I, a friend of mine was an excellent seamstress. She was a costume designer, Polly Smith, and she um, helped me build that. She actually figured out that first prototype. And it really was, for those of you that have heard the story, it really was our first working prototype was two jock straps with, that we bought in the UVM bookstore and Polly cut them apart and sewed them back together so that the cups were now encapsulating breasts and the butt straps were now crossing the shoulders and the waistband became a rib band. And that was actually, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> so did, yeah, did you, that's fascinating. So just thinking of our, students listening now, I mean, you know, today you you put this pitch together, you've got, you know, this plan, you got funding, you got, you know, production. This was sort of, you were just kind of going, it sounds like you're, you had a great idea. And you've said this before, if you can't identify a need, you're probably wasting your time. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh well, and I was, I, you know, it was my need. And I made the assumption that other women, other athletic women also had that need you know, I asked around a little bit, and that turned out to be, in fact, the case. Um, but if if what you're trying to do is not meeting a need, why are you doing it? 
Um, now I could argue that as well, <laughs> but um, really there are three, I think I've said this before too. I mean, there are really three things you have to think about when you're crafting a business. And one, you know, there's the product, there's the people, and then there's the place. And is the product meeting a need or is it improving something that already exists? Um, who are the, And the people part is not just the customers that are experiencing that need or need to be made aware of the need, but it's also the people that are involved in helping this entity come into being, you know, like, like my friend who helped me and the woman who became my business partner who had the passion for the business end of it uh, that wasn't nascent in me. And, um, and then place, of course, that is so interesting because the fact that now, I mean, when I started my business, it was, I was in the sporting goods industry. It was, you know, the, it, it was before any computers. It was before the internet. It was before we had this incredible global marketplace now. And that actually makes the people part more important. Geography anymore, or, um, I mean, it, it really is, who is experiencing this need and how do I reach them? And it makes the people you you bring in to help you even even more important, I think. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, the place piece. I mean, like you said back then, it was like where you know it was just sort of your immediate surroundings. Of course, then you went you went national, but and the, the place now is everywhere. I mean, you know, online sales you you can you can meet you know a massive audience pretty easily. Um, and when, you know, when you were talking about when you first launched and you got a lot of, or you started getting orders, you know, coming in and you're like, uh, how are we going to fill these? Talk a little bit about that. Cause that's kind of fascinating when you had people just jumping in and helping to produce the product and then get it out. Well, it was interesting because, um, I had just, I, I was at UVM and I was just starting a master's program there and, um, I was thinking, how can I, I, I was an older, what then was called an older returning student. So I was um, married at the time and working and trying to do this thing. And um, I thought it would be a nice little mail order business on the side that would help put me through school. <laughs> and um, boy, was I wrong. Uh, with right away that we put a little tiny ad in a running magazine and we started getting uh calls from dealers from retailers and in fact i remember <laughs> i didn't even know what the term dealer meant i didn't know it was the same as a retailer right. and um but I, again so so many people were so helpful one of my favorite stories is when we realized that we were sort of riding this incredible wave that we hadn't expected. You know, I, I knew nothing. I didn't know about orders. I didn't know about retail. We we had to find out what terms we should use for sales. We had to create an order form, you know, and a lot of this, like the first order form and um, the first sell sheet uh, are now in the National Archives down at the Smithsonian, which wow. just cracks, cracks me up. But um <laughs> but uh, one of my favorite stories about learning what I should be doing or how to do things was um, my phone rang one day because in this ad, we had put my address in Burlington and my personal phone number, you know, because that's how naive we were. And my phone rang and it was this, I answered it and uh, it was my phone right this is when they were still attached to the wall by the way <laughs> and it was this gentleman from the from georgia i believe so in the south and he said y'all looking for reps and i said what's a rep 
I had no idea what a sales representative was or that that's how the business worked. And he spent an hour and a half on the phone with me explaining to me how the sporting goods industry did business. And by the end of it, I, I hired him. You know, I said, OK, <laughs> you're on. Uh, and and he, he and his group worked for us for years, for years. But people are so willing to help and so really kind it's it constantly um proved to be the case so ask for help one of my pieces of advice yeah that's that that's a good piece. so like you said earlier you know some of some of the, our students here might have you know they're developing a pitch and they're and, and they're thinking maybe i'm not good like you said you, you didn't necessarily have a great business sense you know, depending on what they're creating and what their product is, finding some where they're weak, an area they might be weak at, bring in somebody. Oh, to, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we didn't realize what we were getting into. It was successful right off the bat, and we had to run to keep up. And one of the first things we did, which was a real leap of faith, was um, we hired a consultant. But I should back up, though, and say, um, uh, you know, I had to learn about I was the the small business administration was one of those entities that was very helpful. And they put they said, you have to write a business plan. I said, huh? <laughs> so instead of um, writing something for my graduate program, some um, I was sitting down trying to figure out the a sales plan and and we literally called them financial fairy tales because I was making it all up. I had no idea. I had no idea. But in the process, I learned a great deal. Uh, and one of the things I learned was how much I didn't know. And then so I hired someone who did know he a consultant, someone who'd been in business, run his own business, worked for others. And it's basically like hiring a tutor. <laughs> yeah. And and were you there? There are things like when you um, things you we, we talked about before that applied back then that could apply today as well. You know, you'd mentioned things like we talked about imposter syndrome, for example. You know, yeah. you and I think a lot of our students, for sure, suffer from it. They're coming up with an idea and then they're thinking, well, you know, who am I? I don't I don't think I had the skills to 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 move this forward. Well, you know, you prove that to be not true, and I think that a lot of them. Um, you know, that the, the fact that you did know a lot of things, yet you overcame it, that's inspirational in a way. Do you have any advice for students in terms of them, uh, you know, feeling hesitant or maybe they don't think they're up to the task? I mean, are there any sort of tried and true things that you learned back then that regardless of advancements in technology and other things, you know, would still apply today? Oh, ab absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you talk, you mentioned the imposter syndrome. I felt like a total fraud because I had, I had been a runner and that's how come I knew about this, but my knees went out and I had to stop running. So here I was all of a sudden, you know, the jog bar queen in, in sport, the sporting goods industry, and I wasn't even participating anymore. And the fact that I didn't know about business, um, I felt, I was sure that any minute, you know, someone was going to confront me or you know, laugh at me or say, who are you to do this? And and that was my own fear operating. One of the, the one of the most important things I can say to anyone looking at taking on this pitch challenge is to run to start a business, whether it's a service business or a product business, there are always going to be obstacles. Always. And the first obstacle is your your that voice in your head, <laughs> you know, um, can be an obstacle. It's the also the voice that's saying, oh, you know, do this, do this. But then there's that little thing going, eh, are you sure? Are you sure? Didn't so-and-so say this? Or what about that? And you were never good at that. <laughs> Look, I, I flunked arithmetic. What was I doing writing business plans, you know, or adding up? Anyway, so the... Uh, you're always going to have obstacles. 
So being a creative problem solver, try persevering, persevering through the obstacle, finding a way around it and, and dealing with your own fear, your own insecurity. I mean, I mean, really, John, do you know anyone that doesn't have a streak of insecurity going through? Them? <laughs> I haven't met him yet. Yeah. <laughs> so you just have to recognize that and say, okay, now what's the next step? What's I had a little sign over my desk when I first started and it just said, because at that point I was both in school and trying to run this business and it just said, persevere, <laughs> persevere. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, that's one. Actually, at CFES, that's one of the um, uh, eight. We have a, a number of uh, words that are sort of uh, used uh, that we identified as, uh, uh, you know, things that would help people to advance and get just persevering through, you know, which is hard because you 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 get told no a hundred times or you make a mistake and then you're you're thinking, oh, I'm going to just I'm going to bail out. I can't do it. But some somehow you got to stay in. And, I, and you had mentioned to me before having people around you that you trusted and that also supported you. I mean, that's, that's huge in any, any endeavor. Well, and even if you don't have that, you know, even uh, you have to look and find those people, but they don't just, you know, they're not automatically there. My family had no idea what I was doing or could talk to me about it, you know, um, but that's where the not only persevering, but being authentic. You know, why are you doing this? Are you doing this because uh, you care about the need or you care about the people that you'll be serving or or because it lights you up inside? This is something that you can see. And you, um, so that conviction, that passion, that authenticity. I mean, I know this all sounds eh, like, I, well, I don't know, but it is so integral it is so important to succeeding in any endeavor but of course a biz a business um and also another thing is uh being curious mm -hmm. being curious like if i had not been a curious young woman the the question might not have entered my head of well how could this change you know what what might make a difference here and, you know, I, I knew nothing about making garments. I knew nothing about the garment industry. I knew nothing, but I was curious. Yeah, that that's, that's uh, without that. Yeah. And the authenticity piece and the fact that you're passionate about, you know, because if you're not, if you're not passionate and you're not authentic about it, I mean, you could just say, you know, you've read studies where it'll say, you know, people that just uh, invent something, but don't care about it. They just want to make money. Sure, it, it 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 it's happened where that's been successful, but uh, most often it's not um, because you don't have that passion and or that auth authenticity. And you would, and I think you know, you talking earlier last time we spoke about, I mean, women in entrepreneurship at that time were close to non-existent. It, it's still it's still a low number, unfortunately. But you you broke some barriers and uh, and, and just by even uh, attempting to get, especially into the business space. That had to be petrifying. Well, again, the times, you know, the the 1970s when, and especially in in Vermont, things were changing radically. But um, women in business were, it, it, we got an SBA loan because we were considered a minority. Oh. No. <laughs> and someone told me recently, I don't know if this is true, that women are still considered a minority and that might just be in vermont sba or i could be totally wrong but it would be interesting to know that um yeah we were breaking a lot of rules and it was again it was a, a societal time when all the rules were changing and you had to kind of figure out well if there's no code of conduct or way that things should be then how do i how do i go forward how do i figure out what works, what doesn't work, what I'm comfortable with, what I'm not uncomfortable, what I'm not comfortable with, and who's going to support me and who's going to get in my way. And it's the answers to those things are not always evident. <laughs> um, it was a, an interesting and challenging time. Mm -hmm. 
We have a question in the chat box, actually, and I, I definitely want to open it up to you know anybody that has questions, and you know, including Brooke, Lily, or Eric, if you want to jump in, because it's such a you know a rare opportunity to 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 talk to Lisa about these things. But the question uh, from a student: um, Could you tell me more about the obstacles that you faced, other than your lack of knowledge of business? So really, any and you could get granular, you know, if there were specific obstacles or larger ones, you know, just anything you face that you had to, how do we figure this out and overcome it? Oh, uh, what ups? Well, everybody's got their stuff, you know. Um, in my case, a one very uh, in my face obstacle was the fact that I have a disability. It's an invisible disability. Um, I have epilepsy. So I didn't have a driver's license. Uh, the number one issue facing people with epilepsy, not the number one non-medical issue is underemployment and unemployment. Um, so I had to, I had all the things I had to deal with to keep myself healthy. And because it wasn't obvious to the general public or to anyone that there was something else going on with me, I talk about, I would pass, I would pass as just fine and normal until I was on a trade show floor and went down into a grand mall convulsion. And then it was out. <laughs> um, so there was that. And that was particular to me, but, um, and then there is also just the not being taken seriously. I mean, um, the assumptions and, and all the, I, you know, it's difficult to talk about now, but you learned, uh, you, one, I learned to laugh at all the bra and breast jokes and the snickering and um, just kind of roll with the punches and had a few of my own. Um, we went in to get a bank loan in Burlington and, um, the male loan officer sat across the desk and said, so uh, what are you two girls with a bra going to ask of me? And it was like, two girls with a bra. Okay. <laughs> um, so you just have to, you know, a sense of humor is also very important. A sense of, because when you're sitting there feeling like a fraud and insecure, you know, Humor is was what one of the things I could always fall back on. Yeah, um, I, and you know, I answered that question yeah. well. No, for sure, absolutely, that's a huge obstacle. Any, any, yeah, if there's any others that you can think of, I know you also did a lot of work with the Epilepsy Foundation. You were on the board, and that was a passion of yours as well. I mean, you had, you know, we talk about you. Sometimes you probably feel like you're defined by the fact that you <laughs> create the jog bra, but you've done so many other things including that, that foundation, I think, um, you know, being, being well-rounded and you had your major, I mean, you had, you're in education, like you had a lot, you brought a lot to the, to the process. Well, having that background in educational admin actually really helped me hand in sales, in sales and market, because, um, for, uh, several years I was, I had, never been in sales, but I was a sales manager. I was running sales reps all over, all over the country. We were so naive that it never even occurred to us um, to just open small, like let's just sell these in the Northeast to begin with. We went national right away. And so I was traveling a lot to train all these sales reps who were, oh, by the way, 99% men. So I was having to talk to these men about how to talk about breast movement and bras. And, <laughs> and so um, being, having a background in edu education was helpful. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure. Um, and, to, and talk a little bit, I, I eventually when things took off, um, you had, you had some large corporations start to eventually that, you know, we're approaching you to buy you out, right? Pretty much. Oh, well, um, yeah. But, um, well, this was, a, 
We started at the very beginning of what's now referred to in the history books as the fitness uh, evol um, ev revolution. The fitness yeah, yeah. And um, everybody was being active and all these companies were starting at that time. I mean, the shoe business, uh, Nike and um, uh, Reebok and all, th th this was just all beginning. It was all becoming a big thing. And um, we actually didn't have to deal with that question of being bought out uh, until later, until we, we had been in business for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And um, my phone rang one day and I mean, that's a whole other story. I mean, I, if I, I'm fond of saying I got my master's in business by, by rent, starting and running a company. I got my PhD by selling it. <laughs> that was a real learning experience. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention um, uh, about some of the obstacles we were facing is that a fact is that most patents are granted to and held by men. Um, I think I've we've talked about this before. the The number of patents held by a woman, women. Are, is I don't know the actual percentage, but it's in the single digits. Once you add a, you know, like uh, Harry and Lisa, Lisa and Harry or something, then it goes up somewhat, but only a bit. So, you know, you got to wonder what the dynamics are behind that. And it it is changing these days. When I was at the, uh, the induction ceremony at the Hall of Fame, there were uh, two other women who were inducted other than us. And that's a big deal. That is a big deal. Yeah. Hopefully that continues that way. And I know you have, speaking of patents, at least 10 uh, that I'm aware of. So you, you've you uh, beat the odds quite well. Um, well, the one that I'd like to talk about is the compression, it was a compression garment for breast cancer survivors, because again, that really did, was a game changer. Uh, there had, um, breast cancer survivors have swelling that has to be dealt with. And for other parts of the body, there were compression garments, but there was nothing for chest and breast. So um, that's the other patent that I'm very proud of that I couldn't have been done without Dr. Leslie Bell, whose idea it was and said, help me do this, Lisa. So. Wow. Yeah. So um, that one. Yeah. And then Oh, let me go. We got two other questions, kind of a follow up. Despite the obstacle obstacles you faced, what were some of the positive positives about starting and growing a business in Vermont? <laughs> oh wow! Um, I I think the biggest thing was uh, it was exciting. Oops, excuse me. <laughs> um, it was exciting and and the amount of personal growth that being in this business afforded um, us, I'm trying to turn off my phone here. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I met so many people. I, I experienced, I've been all over this country. I've experienced other people's lives, their concerns, their, I mean, I got to see the world. I went, we, I, I got to see the world <laughs> and, um, it was a thrilling, thrilling. And it made me really um, grow as a person. And that's the other thing I say about starting your own business, um, that your business will only grow if you can grow with it. You know, if you can look at your weaknesses and look at your strengths and be honest with yourself about it and and take the steps necessary. And, you know, that is not always easy. I mean, we talk about the imposter syndrome, but, you know, then there's, are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? Are you, uh, do you have a sense of humor? Do you not have a sense of humor? You know, are you comfortable in groups or <laughs> all, you know, all of that? Yeah, that's important. I mean, when you say that, I think depending on the product or, you know, what, what you're pitching, in some ways it might need to match your personality a little bit. Now, you know, it's a little different with 
a number of products you could launch online. You're kind of, you don't have to worry about being an extrovert quite as much, but that's a, that's a really good point though. Cause you probably should take these things into consideration based on your own uh, personality and, and sort of attributes. Well, and willingness to, to grow and to change. Like if, if, if you are, and how how to deal with that growth. I mean, one of the reasons I truly believe we were successful is my business partner, Hinda, and I were very different people. We were very different people, but we were both committed to personal growth. So, what, you know, we, we would be at loggerheads about something and be able to kind of take it apart and say, okay, you know, she just wanted to go forward. I wanted to think of seven different ways to go forward, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so was that that could be I mean, that sounds in some ways helpful because you're, you know, you're bouncing things off each other and you're not both like, oh, yeah, let's do this. You're, there's a little bit of a little bit of friction. And maybe that's good. But also, I'm sure it was probably challenging in other ways. Oh, it was very it was very challenging. But but we both wanted the best for you know, we called it our baby, you know, the, the child, the business. And, um, and that's what kept us not only together, but the business kept being successful. We were incredibly successful on consistently, consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's impressive. Cause like you said, things change and if you can't roll with it, it's not going to stay consistent. It's going to be over, you know, before, before you know it. Um, another question for you here in the chat box. So um, it says, Hey, Lisa, your story is inspiring. I'd love to meet you sometime. I'm 17, currently running a small business at MHS. Uh, what, what has been your best mantra for dealing with the fear when pursuing a challenge? I breathe deeply. I uh, learned to meditate along the way mm. and and to recognize, you know, I'm impressed with this question because to recognize the fear is the beginning of dealing with it. You just say, okay, there it is. You might think about why it is or how it is, and then you set it aside. Persevere. Yeah, that's great advice. It's almost... That's really interesting because it's almost like counterintuitive and maybe it depends on the person, but you think, oh, here's an obstacle, you know, you think plow through and just get gritty and not that you don't need those things, but you're saying, take a breath, I, identify and sort of confront the, the the fear, you know, and then, and then move forward still persevering, but that, that's, uh, that's really good advice. And and that's part of the of what I was saying earlier about um, being willing to engage with and experience personal growth. Why am I afraid of that? You know what what is it about the situation that's making me anxious? And you know it doesn't mean you're going to solve it in the moment, but at least being aware, rather than you know. So <laughs> there have been studies about this about how much these un unidentified fears and anxieties that have started sometimes in childhood, you know, are dictating our behaviors and our thoughts and our preferences. And when it's unconscious like that, that how can you change? How can you say, oh, yes, I accept that. Okay, I like that. Or, oh, no, I don't want to be dealing with that. Or, oh, you know, that was my mother's idea. That That's not what I, you know, what I prefer. You know, all the, all those being conscious, being conscious. And did you learn that? Was that something, did it take, did you learn that later, early on? Did you kind of develop? How did you kind of like realize how to deal with things like that? Was it later? No, it started very early. And this is, a, um, it started very early because when you have epilepsy, you are living every day under threat. Now, I didn't think about it exactly that way when I was a child, but it was the case. You know, I could go down at any moment. I could have a seizure at any moment. Um, so that there is a choice there about are you going to live your life or are you going to now? Now, let me preface all this by saying I am very, 
very lucky. I am so blessed because my seizure disorder is mostly controlled. And I'm not, I mean, I've met and spoken with people who are having seizures every single day, every single day. And I didn't, I, I had medication that made that not happen. So, so this is what I call a shadow teacher. When you're able, when some obstacle or circumstance or threat makes you have to think about what you're doing, how you're doing it, and why you're doing it. So I really, I, I think that it's very, um, well, so I had to think about things early on and I chose to, I mean, I chose to think about them and it was because I didn't want to, I didn't want to be interfered with. I mean, basically it was, I wanted to go to the beach. I wanted to go swimming at the beach. So I figured out how to make that happen without having, you know, somebody always with me or something. I could, um, I learned how to ride a bike, which was not also not, you weren't supposed to ride a bike when you were a kid, but, um, so I, I think that obstacles are often great teachers. Yeah, that's really interesting. You had, you had plenty of them early on and developed that coping mechanisms to, to deal in you know, it, which paid dividends later in your business and the rest of your life. That That's, that's, that's pretty, well, and, pretty amazing. And, and everybody has something, you know, there, it, 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 it's just in my case, again, I was lucky. It was kind of obvious <laughs> to <laughs> me anyway. Um, and to those are anyway, but everybody's got something, whether it's everybody's got something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, two other questions here. One, one I, I was speaking with somebody prior to this and they were, they wanted me to ask. So they, they have problems with deadlines. They are procrastinators. Mm. I, any advice you have in turn, you know, you, 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 you've got this pitch idea, you want to launch your business. And, and all of a sudden you're like, you got some procrastination, you got to meet some deadlines. Any advice on, on how to meet those? Yes, because actually that's one of my things too. I am a terrible procrastinator. And someone said to me once, one step at a time, just move it forward a little bit, just move it forward. And that I thought, okay, I don't have to finish it. I don't have to, I just have to take the next step. And that was helpful. And, and also the other thing that I, I don't know if this is true for every procrastinator, but for this procrastinator, I realized that what was behind it was perfectionism, wanting to do it exactly right, or just so, or, and that was stopping me. That was a stop. Uh, and so when I realized that, I went, okay, it might not be perfect, but not this time, you know, but at least it will be moving closer to the goal, closer to the end, closer to creating whatever I want to create. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's good. That's and that um this question too is sort of related a little, but um, you know, because you you're working so hard and you're trying to like move things forward. And this this question is how do you um, work to separate yourself from your business? Um, well, that would depend on why you want to separate yourself from your business. I mean, that's a very, that's a very deep and broad question. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't think they want to follow up in the chat box. I mean, I'm assuming it's sort of, you know, how do you separate yourself? You know, you, you've got, you, you're working constantly, you know, how do you sort of take separate it and uh, not well, get a break but sort of you well you know again what this gets back to is what we've talked about earlier which is why are you doing this if it's a path of the heart if it's something you're passionate about it's part of you and so when you need a break you know being aware of yourself enough to know okay i need a break i'm going to think about something else but if it's something that you care about it is part of you and uh 
you would need to be clear about why you're separating yourself from your business. And, you know, that scares me hearing me say it like that, because I sure as heck didn't think I was my business and the business was me. Matter of fact, I fought against that a lot in the early years. Well, no, actually in the later, <laughs> I'm more than just the jog bra lady, I used to say. Um, <laughs> but uh that's such an interesting question. I wonder why the question's being asked. Here we go. Again, example. Getting tired of phrases such as, oh, you're the sports bra lady when you had many other interests and skills. So I'm sorry, where's the question? There? Well, just they're following up saying like, you know, everybody's saying, oh, you're just a jog bra lady that you work all the time. That's all you do, despite <laughs> having other, you know, all these other skills and interests which would be different, you know, that's where you would step away. To I, get enjoy. I, I get it. Well, and the truth is in the early years, I hardly ever stepped away. I, I mean, was going to say, I got a feeling you worked all the time. <laughs> well, you, um, you, you kind of had to, um, but I love to go out in the garden. So I would go out and garden or when I was still able to run, that was the, the best and the biggest, you know, I would just go out for a run. And um, that de-stressed and separated me a lot. Uh, and then later it was gardening. and But it wasn't until quite a few years in when there was, you know, and, and let me say the business was always changing because it was growing. It's, it is literally like having a child, you know, what worked for when they were two is not working when they're six, you know, so um but i think that i again because i was passionate about it and i was young being young is a good thing yeah. you have a lot of energy <laughs> <laughs> definitely helps um this one it's broad but it's interesting how, how would you define your your personal values oh um how would I define? Uh, I would, how do I define? I like to think that I'm uh, an ethical person. I believe very much in the do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that old adage. Um, and I mean it when I talk about a path with the heart. And now what I really love is science is catching up with that. And there's a lot of talk about how breathing helps de-stress and what, because of what the heart does. And so the, that sort of new agey woo-woo phrase, path with the heart, turns out to be very critical. Um, am I answering the question, John? Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there was one one other one you you addressed a little bit earlier, but were there any um, strong partnerships that were key, key to growing your business? You know, maybe other than that you that you mentioned. Um, yes, actually. So, so of course, there are the obvious, my business partner, Hinda, and the consultant I mentioned. But our, I hired a sales and an advertising firm. And the woman who owned that firm became such an important um supporter and educator she taught me a lot about marketing and um uh so there was she was very important to our success and my personal growth and then we you know earlier i talked about how most of the sales reps were men well that began to change of course because of the times and there were two uh sales representatives uh, we that worked with us for years that literally contributed so much to the success of our business. And one became our VP of came in house and became our VP of sales and marketing, Jan Kimbrell. And um, these people who got it, they, you know, Jan, Noreen, Judy, they, they really got it and they supported it and they represented it out in the world. I'm so grateful to those women. Yeah, it sounds pretty key because I mean, if someone's not 
understanding or getting your product, they're going to take in some direction. You're not, you know, it's not well, going to work. And yeah, I want to talk about the Noreen the, the, and Jan because they taught me so much. They understood the sales end. They understood how buyers thought. They un they understood this whole world that was foreign to me, and they they taught me. And I I mean they it, uh, that business would not be what it was without their energies, their passion, and their commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I did want to see I, Lily. I don't know if you had any questions um, as well. I know you, you, Lily was president of the um, Entrepreneurship Club there, and and you know, as I'm sure, sure I've seen many uh, many a pitch, and and some that worked and some didn't. Uh, but and and she's gonna wrap up a little bit. I think we're about ten minutes out, but uh, I have. I'll try and cut it short because I got to, I could talk to you all day and I got about 10 other questions of my own, but, um, I, do you, do you work with any younger entrepreneurs today, at least at all, or do you, do you give advice or do you kind of interact with any that, um, you know, people who are anything, who knows, AI, you know, whatever, some, something newer today that, uh, people well, are working on? Yes, of course I have in, in the past, but, um, you know, things have changed a lot. So once you talk about those universal things that that don't change, that haven't changed, um, have to do with it. people, place, product, service, passion, integrity. Um, so I don't make a living being a entrepreneurial consultant by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm always happy to answer people's questions. That's good. Yeah. And I'll, our, you say that now I'm going to have students, we're going to get students your email address. <laughs> no, but if they have any questions, we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll keep them to a minimum. Um, here, a couple more in the chat though. Um, Lily, for some of some from, uh, for some of, of your other uh, patent items, how do you conduct market research to ensure that uh, there was a market besides the word of mouth boom that came with the sports bra. Um, you know, that's a really good question. And it, it provokes a funny story, uh, which is if I had done market research um, before starting the jog bra sports bra business, I would not have started the business. Because the market research I would have done would have been around bras and bra sales and all that. And bra sales had literally been, pardon the pun, flat mm -hmm. for decades. And all the bra manufacturers were just stealing market share back and forth from each other. But the, the category was not growing at all. And, you know, not having foresight, I, I would not have understood or known that really we we're talking about sporting goods. Although that was a marketing decision I made early on, that this that this product was not lingerie, it was athletic equipment. Now, that market was booming like crazy. So, so I'm all for market research. However, be careful, because if you're really doing something new and a little bit disruptive and uh, improved, the current market is only going to give you limited information. Uh, it will give you information. It's probably good to have, but be analytical about it. Does that answer yeah. the question? Yeah, it's kind of fascinating because, uh, you know, had you done market research, you would have got discouraged and probably not done it. Yeah. Not, to, but, but your point is well taken because you're not saying don't do it, but you're saying take it with, you know, a grain of salt and sort of um, use it as information to move forward, don't, don't not discourage. Well, the best case scenario, had I done market research, maybe I would have made, that is what would have made me say, okay, this isn't lingerie. I'm not going to play in that market. This is athletic equipment. But I don't know that I would have done that. And luckily, my gut, my intuition uh, was what told me to do that. So, you know, there are no great definitive answers. <laughs> yeah. 
but you know, your gut and, you know, you got the research, then you got your gut and you kind of, you know, look between the two and decide. Um, yeah, cause the last reason, excuse me. The reason why someone's interested in going into an area, there's gotta be something in there. There's gotta be some gut, some instinct. And that's, that's the thing to pay the most attention to. There are a lot of naysayers out there, both in the, in the information and, and, you know, either your older brother or that person you never got along with. There are a lot of naysayers. And it's always interesting to listen with your Teflon suit on, you know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, listen to him, but trust your gut. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, one last one here. We got, uh, what, what do you think are some great resources to learn about business models and entrepreneurship in, in general? books, shows, any, anything, even, you know, that you, you, back in the day that you read or something current or your own book for that. How about your own book? <laughs> That's a good resource. My own book is good. <laughs> <laughs> Unleash, read Unleash the Girls. No, actually, I'm not kidding. Um, not, uh, I, I am not kidding. I learned so much. And, um, also the other thing is we are living in a time now where things are changing so rapidly uh that to go back to what the to the text the business school textbooks or such you know it doesn't it's good information to have but you have to be aware and look at the world and and feel the energy and um make your own decision and hopefully it will be for the greater good that's uh that sounds like a, a, a perfect place to to leave it. Um can't tell you how much we appreciate it. And we'll you know, this we recorded this and we'll share it with a lot of students. So if we have follow-up questions, I'd love to send them your way and kind of keep this conversation going. And as as students put in their pitch and the challenge moves along, uh, we could love to run a few of them by you, see what you think of them and uh well, continue. I, I, would, for... I I would love that. I would I would like. I think I said to you once, um, if I hadn't done this, I probably would have been a teacher. <laughs> I would have been teaching. So um, this is fascinating. And I'm so excited there are young people out there going to do their own thing, change the world. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we will we'll do this again, I'm sure. And um, we have one, I think, one final slide here before we... And yeah, the, our next um, our third edition of uh, next month's Entrepreneurial Exchange, uh, how to build a successful business model. So we can use things from that Lisa share with us today. Uh, Eric Munson, one of my favorite professors when I, I was at UVM for a long time. And uh, he's done a lot of really good research, but also helped a lot of students uh, uh, along the way. So he's a Grossman School of Business Associate Professor and Stephen Grossman Endowed Chair in entrepreneurship, that'll be fascinating. And I think it's a good way to, he'll bring some stuff to the table that we can couple with what, what Lisa shared with us, with us today. So thank, thank you again, Lisa and, 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 uh, every, everybody for joining in and, uh, we'll, 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 we'll do it again next month with, uh, Eric. Great. Thank you, John. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Really. Take care. Bye.